At 10 a.m., January the 15th, 1947, Betty Berzinger, a local housewife, was walking down Norton Avenue in Los Angeles when she saw something disturbing in an empty lot on the street. When she first saw the corpse, Berzinger said that the body was so white that at first she assumed it was a mannequin. But when she realised that what she was actually looking at was a severed corpse, she ran to contact the authorities. The body Berzinger found was Elizabeth Short, known posthumously as the Black Dahlia. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Dark History Podcast. Hope everybody is well. I'm Rob, your host as always. For episode 16, as you may have guessed, we're going to look into the strange and mysterious death of Elizabeth Short, or no more commonly as the Black Dahlia. The murder that has grown in infamy as the decades have fell away. A cold case and a mystery that's plagued law enforcement and ultimately will never be solved. So without further ado, sit back and relax for more dark history. Long before her grisly demise, Elizabeth Shaw was born on July the 29th, 1924, in the Hyde Park section of Boston, Massachusetts. The third of five daughters of Cleo A. Shaw and his wife, Phoebe May Sawyer. Short's father built miniature golf courses until he lost most of his savings in the 1929 stock market crash. In 1930, his car was found abandoned on the Charlestown Bridge, and it was assumed that he jumped into the Charles River. Believing her husband to be deceased, Short's mother began working at a bookkeeper's to support the family. On top of all Phoebe May's troubles, Elizabeth was a sickly child. Troubled by bronchitis and severe asthma attacks, Short underwent lung surgery at age 15, after which doctors suggest periodically relocating to a milder climate to prevent further respiratory problems. Short's mother sent her to spend winters in Miami, Florida, with a family friend for the next three years. In her sophomore year, Short dropped out of Medford High School. Surprisingly, in late 1942, Short's mother received a letter of apology from a presumed deceased husband, which revealed that he was in fact alive and had started a new life in California. So in December, at age 18, Short relocated to Vallejo, California, to live with her father, whom she had not seen since the age of six. At the time, he was working at nearby Murr Island Naval Yard on San Francisco Bay. This arrangement would not last though, as arguments between Short and her father led to her moving out in January of 1943. Short took a job at the base exchange at Camp Cook, but this didn't work out, and she bounced around from place to place until she settled in Florida. While in Florida, Short met Major Matthew Michael Gordon Jr., a decorated Army Air Force officer of the 2nd Air Commando Group, who was training for deployment in the Southeast Asian theatre of World War II. Short later told friends that Gordon had written to propose marriage while he was recovering from injury from a plane crash in India, which she accepted. Unfortunately, their love story was cut short, as Gordon died in a second crash on August 10th, 1945 less than a week before the end of the war. In July 1946, Short decided to relocate again, this time to Los Angeles to visit an Army Air Force Lieutenant, Joseph Gordon Fickler, an acquaintance from Florida, who was stationed at the Naval Reserve Air Base in Long Beach. While there, she got a job at waitressing and lived in a one-bedroom apartment behind a nightclub. It was alleged that she occasionally resorted to prostitution to make ends meet, although these accusations were never proven. What is commonly asserted is that Short had dreamed of making it big in Hollywood. Unfortunately, she would never be given the chance. On the morning of the 15th of January 1947, Short's naked body, severed into two pieces, was found on a vacant lot on the west side of South Norton Avenue, midway between Coliseum Street and West 39th Street in the neighbourhood of Limert Park. Betty Berzinger discovered the body at approximately 10am 
while walking with her three-year-old daughter, initially thinking she'd found a discarded store mannequin. When she realised it was a corpse, she rushed to a nearby house to telephone the police. Short's severely mutilated body was completely severed at the waist and drained of all blood, leaving her skin paled white. Medical examiners determined that she had been dead for around 10 hours prior to her discovery, leaving her time of death either sometime during the evening of January the 14th or the early hours of January the 15th. The body had apparently been washed by the killer. Short's face had been slashed from the corner of her mouth to her ear, creating an effect known as the Glasgow smile. She had several cuts on her thighs and breasts, where entire portions of her flesh had been sliced away. The lower half of her body was positioned a foot away from her upper and her intestines, were tucked neatly beneath her buttocks. The corpse had been posed, with her hands over her head, her elbows bent at a right angle, and her legs spread apart. When the police began to investigate the murder, they found the last known person to see Elizabeth Short alive was a man named Robert Red Manley. On January the 9th, 1947, Short returned to her home in Los Angeles, After a brief trip to San Diego with Manley, Manley was a 25-year-old married salesman she had been dating. Manley stated that he dropped Short off at the Baltimore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles and that Short was meeting her sister, who was visiting from Boston that afternoon. Unsurprisingly, he would be the first suspect for the murder and was ultimately picked up by police. Manley, who had been discharged from the army, and was described as a mentally unstable due to several nervous breakdowns, was questioned by police, but in the end he was let go due to a solid alibi and the passing of a lie detector test on two separate occasions. The real killer, who was still at large, seemingly disliked the fact that someone else was taking credit for his macabre handiwork. On January 21st, 1947, a person claiming to be Short's killer placed a phone call to the offices of James Richardson, the editor of The Examiner, congratulating Richardson on the newspaper's coverage of the case, and stated that he planned on eventually turning himself in, but not before allowing police to pursue him further. Now, there's something that goes on in the story a bit later on, and you'll find out that this guy's a real tosser. Anyway. Additionally, the caller told Richardson to expect some souvenirs of Beth Short in the mail. On January 24th, a suspicious manila envelope was discovered by the US Postal Service. The envelope was addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers, with individual words that had been cut and pasted from newspaper clippings. A large message on the face of the envelope read, Here is the Dali's belongings letters to follow. The envelope contained Short's birth certificate, business cards, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with a name, Mark Hansen, embossed on the cover. Hansen was a nightclub owner who let Short occasionally sleep at his house because she was close friends with his girlfriend. He too was one of the last people to talk to Short before her demise and become a suspect in the investigation. Similarly to Elizabeth Short's body, the packet had been carefully cleaned with gasoline, which led police to suspect that the packet had been sent directly by her killer. Despite the efforts to clean the packet though, several partial fingerprints were lifted from the envelope and sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation for testing. However, the prints were compromised in transit and thus could not be properly analysed. The very same day as the letters were received, the victim's handbag and a shoe were found on the top of a rubbish bin a couple of miles away from where Elizabeth Short's remains were found. There was no identifying items in the purse, but Red Manley recognised the belongings as Short's. This put police's tails up. Unfortunately, the momentary lapse by the killer brought no fingerprints, as he had the sense of mind to clean the items with petrol again. The communication with the alleged killer continued with letters and phone calls being placed with all of LA's newspapers. 
Every page the same, with messages cut from magazines. Every envelope and piece of paper identical to the first package. One message read, I will give up Dahlia's killer if I get ten years. Don't try to find me. But quite obviously, the killer would never come good on his offer. As always with high profile cases, things changed quickly. Suddenly tips and confessions began to pour into the heavily saturated and already murky case. Even more so after city councilman Lloyd G. Davis posted a $10,000 reward, equivalent to $121,000 today. With this announcement, the police had to sift through thousands of these leads, who were coming in from all walks of life. Decades later, the LAPD still received dozens of confessions, each more crazier than the last. One even saw an apparent suicide on a beach, where police find a pile of clothes at the scene. Inside the shoes was a note which read, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killings, but they have not. I'm too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this was the best way out for me. The note wasn't signed, and nobody's washed ashore, so the police dismissed this claim as another grim hoax. The sad truth is, with thousands of man hours being plunged into the case, the LAPD and the FBI made almost no headway, constantly hindered by false claims and hoaxes. One thread of detail that law enforcement deduced was that the killer had some sort of medical training. With the help from the FBI and the database of medical and dental students, they managed to materialise a few leads, but none of them had enough evidence for arrest. What is quite shocking was how much the media had a field day with the Black Dahlia case. Through the media, the country was enraptured by the murder of Elizabeth Short. As we obviously know, she was posthumously dubbed the Black Dahlia. But where this moniker comes from is largely unknown. Some say it, the newspapers came up with it. Others say it was a nickname given to Sharp by her friends. Another is that someone overheard a conversation between police officers calling her that. What is clear is that if the media didn't become so obsessed with the case, Elizabeth Sharp's murder would probably have been swallowed by obscurity. This hits home when you hear a similarly gruesome murder happen not a month later. On February the 10th, 1947, the murder of Gian French in Los Angeles was also considered by the media and detectives as possibly being connected to Short's killing. French's body was discovered in West Los Angeles on Grandview Boulevard nude and badly beaten. Written on her stomach in lipstick was what appeared to say fuck you BD and the letters text below. The Herald Express covered the story heavily and drew comparisons to the Sharp murder less than a month prior summarising the initials BD to stand for Black Dahlia. However, the scrawling actually read PD ostensibly standing for Police Department what is shocking is the way the media was desperate to milk Short's case for all it's worth. The Los Angeles Examiner, here's why I call him a tosser, proved how low they would stoop for an exclusive. This egregious piece of journalism destroyed any piece of human decency the media had. Soon after Short was identified, the Examiner telephoned Short's mother before she'd learned of her daughter's demise told her that her daughter had won a beauty contest and they wanted a little background information on their new winner's early life. It was only after did she find out the heartbreaking truth that her daughter had in fact been murdered. After a few months had passed, the police had 75 suspects whom they deemed good enough for scrutiny. By the time they got to a grand jury, they had close to 200 and yet, the only arrests that made it were for obstruction of justice pertaining to false confessions. As you would know before you began listening to this episode, the killer has never been caught, but some people did have strong connections, such as a doctor named Walter Baylor, proposed by the former Times copy editor Larry Harnsinch. Times publisher Norman Chandley 
was also a suspect, whom's biographer, Donald Wolfe, claims impregnated Short. Leslie Dillon, Joseph A. Dumas, Artie Lane, Mark Hansen, Francis E. Sweeney, Woody Guthrie, Bugsy Siegel, Orson Welles, George Hodel, Hodel's friends Fred Sexton, George Knowlton, Robert Red Manley, Patrick S. O'Reilly, and Jack Anderson Wilson were also major suspects. George Hill Holdell Jr. was a suspect. Like the others, he was never formally charged with the crime. He came to wider attention as a suspect after his death, when he was accused by his son, Los Angeles homicide detective Steve Hodel, of killing Short and committing several additional murders prior to the Dahlia case. He was also a suspect in the death of his secretary, Ruth Spaulding, but was not charged and was accused of raping his own daughters, but also acquitted. He fled the country several times and spent from 1950 to 1990 in the Philippines. So that was the story of the Black Dahlia. What fascinates me about this case, like everyone, is not knowing who did it. I mean, this was a really high profile case and is legendary nowadays, but yet we are no closer to solving it than we were 80 years ago. It's baffling that there were so many suspects, but not enough leads, and it drums up images of Jack the Ripper. I mean, my money's on Hanson. He had access to Short's belongings. You knew the killer was cavalier in how he went about goading the police. That's why he gave them the embossed handbook, even though he did give it to her as a gift. He had also tried to seduce Shaw, and when she refused, he allegedly raped her, but was never charged. He used his wealth and connections to rid himself of any police investigation. He would also give contradictory statements. Anyway, if you liked the episode, please drop us a five-star review. If you think your friends and family may like it, then share it with them. Links to TikTok, YouTube, Insta, and the show email are below. If you've been listening to for a while, and not subscribed, please do it. That way you never miss an episode. So with all that out of the way, please join me for episode 17 and more Dark History.